Greetings, and what a beautiful morning it is to worship the Lord in Ypsilanti. I'm Pastor Keith Geiselman. Welcome as we continue these weeks online. Um, as I read the data this morning, Omicron cases are 142 um, per 100,000. In contrast, we were four times lighter than that. We were about 32 cases last August when we reopened. We haven't set a metric as to what would be required to reopen live, but I'm hopeful in the next couple weeks we'll return to be together with choir and fellowship and rejoicing, as indeed we can wherever we are. So I'm reminded that what does the Holy One require of us, writes the prophet Micah, to be just and kind and humble before God. For Holy God, you confounded the world's wisdom by giving your kingdom to the lowly and pure in heart. Give us such a hunger and thirst for justice and perseverance in striving for peace that by our words and deeds, the world may see the promise of your kingdom revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.
Thank you for being with us today from home, from tuning in on our devices as we call them. May the Lord be present through you where you are right now. Let me offer too that next week on February 6th we have our annual meeting. Like last year, we'll again do it on Zoom. It worked very well because we'll be virtual for next week for sure. Um, so you'll get a note on the church email on Wednesday of how to connect to the annual meeting on Zoom held next Sunday at 11 a.m. I now turn our attention into the center of worship, hearing the word of the Lord. So Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you say to us today. So the psalmist in the center of the Psalms at the 71st recording offers these words. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my mouth and from my youth. Upon you I have learned from my birth that it was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Well, Paul was one that was taken from his mother's womb and raised up in righteousness. And he writes to the church in Corinth, who are in conflict and difficulty, I must note, when we come to the 13th chapter of his letter to them. But not one to always be dour or corrective. Paul offers, too, a glimpse of hope and power in the Word and the Spirit. So he says to them in the 13th chapter these wonderful words. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful, arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, and I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, and then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to flash back a few years for a movie reference, see if you can catch it with me. For sadly, I can no longer recite this text without thinking of the movie The Wedding Crashers. If you need something kind of old and funny to watch, about 20 years now. In this box office hit, Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn play best friends who crash weddings. They so they do so by de developing elaborate cover stories to charm the crowd and become the life of the party. In one of the early scenes as the movie opens, the two are at a wedding. 
And when the pastor announces the bride's sister will now read scripture, as I have done often, Owen says to Vince, $20, 1 Corinthians. To which Vince replies, double or nothing, Colossians 3.12. Now, one amazing thing is here is that they know enough scripture to quote it. But their knowledge is limited. Well, the bride sister takes the podium and begins, and now a reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Well, like Owen, my money would have been on 1 Corinthians 13 too. It's one of the best known passages in the Bible because of its use in weddings and a bunch of other movies too. It's easy to understand why. It represents one of the most beautiful expressions, poetry of love found in the Bible, its clarity, its specificity. And because the, back, the passage doesn't reference God or Christ, it's selected for its broad appeal to one's guests, whatever a spiritual occasion arises. It has become one of those texts that we know exactly when to use. But I wonder if we fully considered what it might be saying to us. I know it often surprises people when I announce at weddings, like I like to do a little cheekily sometimes, that this passage, as I cited, comes at the end of Paul talking about the church in conflict. I don't know if everyone always likes to hear about that reality at weddings, but anybody in an intimate relationship knows it well. For the price of going towards deeper intimacy, knowledge of another, we must cross through the land of being conflicted. Conflict opens the door to greater intimacy and closeness. I know this is true for me, but in a hundred plus times I've heard or used this text, I've relished the beautiful expression it has about love, about its steadfastness and care and listening. But we need to pause long enough to consider two questions that it raises in the text. The first is at the end. How can it be that love is more important than faith? Paul, above all, talks about faith all the time. Since I was a child, I have been taught that faith in Christ is the key to everything. And while this text includes faith and hope, it says that love is greater than both of them. How is it we can extol the greatness of love at the expense of faith? Item number two. If love is the most important thing we can pursue... Why does the passage imply that we're still missing something? If love is what life is all about, why does Paul conclude by saying that we only see dimly? We only know in part. It leaves me wondering what it might be that we're missing. What is still incomplete about us? Well, this morning, let's focus on all that. Perhaps in our wrestling with these two questions, we will leave and become more inspired about faith and hope and lay hold even more so to love, which is the greatest of these, of course. There's something deep within us that knows that love is the most important thing. It's true that it gets overlooked in our hectic pace of life, and it's easily forgotten amidst the many priorities vying for our attention, especially when we feel a lot of stress. I was a wonderful Christian man in the congregation I served near Chicago before coming to Ypsilanti. He was a business consultant, and he helped the Archdiocese of Chicago with parish and school consolidations. And he once observed during coffee hour that when the church is doing well, it uses spiritual or biblical language. And it, when it's struggling with something controversial, it uses business language. The first tried to bring people closer together, and the second, to keep them at arm's length. And often he wondered, why did they lose sight of their own core? For we know how important love is. That's why 20 years ago I started calling the messages I offer at funerals words of faith, 
hope, and love. For we know that love is the key to relationships, and it is the final statement, the final tally, as it will. Love is what gives meaning to life, and we all live in the hope that our lives will be filled with love. Now, as much as we yearn for all of that, we're all fumbling our way through life, trying to figure out how to do this thing called love, Think about it. Why is it that so many, just your neighbors, maybe family members, folks you have coffee with, dread going home for the holidays or having people over? Why is it that so many marriages truly wanting to love one another, yet struggle day to day to express it? Why is it that in raising children we can become so frustrated we no longer know what love looks like. Maybe it all stems from the simple thing that we all can use a little help in growing love. We need help tapping into that source of love itself. And if it isn't possible, then I'm not sure there's any hope for any of us. We've all had times in relationships, I am sure, that it has become so frustrating and painful that all we can do is muster a veneer of civility that covers over anger and hurt. To ask us to love in those situations is well beyond our capacity, it seems. And when this occurs, it doesn't help to ask us to look deeper within ourselves because our love tank is empty. We might think less, you might think less of me for admitting this, but only by in situations I have known where my love tank is empty where anger and bitterness have grown too big, where I lose my will to love certain people, and how to find my way back, how to come out of that place which I've gone into reclusion, to come out into life, or in the simplest words, to walk across the room and sit down and have a word to be close. I don't think I'm alone in that. I think many of us struggle because when we look inside ourselves, it is hard to find the capacity to love in situations. It's not that we give up. It's not that we stop trying. We continue to hold the hope that somehow and in some way things might be different. How can love be more important than faith, I asked. The Apostle Paul's answer, in my words, would be that because faith is an instrument, faith is the road, and love is the goal. This makes love the greatest of these, but we must never forget, and this is critical, that while love may rank higher than faith, we may not be able to love without faith. Emil Bruner speaks of this in a little book he entitled big surprise, faith, hope, and love. Bruner was a theological superstar back in the 1950s and 60s, and in probing the relationship between faith and love, he said that, well, quote, faith is nothing in itself but the openness of our heart to God's love. The openness of our heart to God's love. And may that love flow through us, I would add, to all whom we become in contact with. Martin Luther offered the phrase at Christmas, may our heart become a manger for the Holy Spirit. May our heart be a manger to the child. May our heart be a manger to God's love. Faith is the instrument that opens us up to God's love. It puts us in touch with the source of love itself. Faith allows us to draw from that source so that the love of God, shown to us in Christ, can show itself to others through our lives. This is critical in being able to love, to know in those tense moments when all you feel is anger or frustration you know, those moments in a relationship when things have become so complicated 
you no longer know what love looks like. Rather than trying to generate a feeling of love within us, perhaps we need to turn to our faith so that we open ourselves to the source of love itself. It's then that love can find its way into our relationships. This gives us the hope that no matter what is going on inside of us, through our faith, God is able to help restore our capacity to love and to be loved. Paul gives us some advice here. He also placed a warning label on love. He points out that as great as love is, we're still missing something. He warns us that we only see dimly, only know in part. My ruminations about this second question, as I put it, I started looking for the root of love in the Bible, and I found an interesting connection with the Hebrew word compassion, which means to suffer with, among the obvious meanings like that, it also carries this meaning, another one I found out. It means womb or womb-like. And I found all this a bit perplexing. Then it dawned on me that to love or to have compassion for someone is to give birth to something. And as more and more love is shared, it nurtures what was born within us. There's a life-giving quality to love, for I have leaned from my birth that it was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually to you to be held in the hands of God like a mother holding her infant, to sit in the lap of God who admires all our works, even the ones we have yet to finish. I often remember when we began passing the peace in church. Some would just turn to their left and right some would withhold their hands, and as the journey took place, week to week, we could not contain the passing of the peace. It was first the children to break ranks, no containing their excitement to meet and to greet and to smile, and love broke loose. This journey of love would lead us to a new place. In all this, we see that though love may give birth to something new, we don't control it, and we don't under fully understand where the journey of love will take us. It's filled with twists and turns. It will have highs and lows. We won't always see the results of our love. Paul tells us that we see only dimly and know only in part. What we do know is that we shall always have the hope that any love shared is never in vain. Though it may not always be evident, love always nurtures new possibilities within us and between us. When we're hurt or scared, may God's love to us cast our fears aside so that we may rise up and walk across the room and sit together a little while, offering our love because God first loved us. So may Paul's words remind us and may God's love flow through us as we are embraced in faith and hope and love. So, O oh God, source of love, I pray, may our faith open us to the mystery of your love, and may the love shown through Christ show in us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, be wherever you are, continue to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God in our offerings this morning. Amen. <laughs>
May our hearts be united in prayer with the boldness and confidence of God's children. As we pray this morning, I say to you, gracious God, Lord of light, offer in your own heart and mind or with your voice, hear our prayer. For loving God, in Christ you embrace people of every nation and make them members of the same body, sharers in the promise of the gospel for the holy church of God that through its faithful witness the wisdom of God in its rich variety be known in heaven and earth. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, you judge the people with righteousness and the poor with justice. For nations, rulers, and authorities to forsake violence and be guided by the light of truth, that righteousness may flourish and justice abound in every land. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, we never know what we might be, entertaining angels unaware. For Ypsilanti and for all who live here, may we be a community of hospitality, welcoming the stranger and sheltering the refuge. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, in your providence, creation yields its good fruits, that all may enjoy its riches. For our planet Earth, that we may dwell peacefully with nature, to be good stewards of its resources, and share its abundance for the sake of human flourishing. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, you defend the cause of the poor, give deliverance to the needy, save those who are oppressed. For those who suffer the cruelty of poverty, and for all who endeavor to transform systems of economic injustice. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. For loving God, you take pity on the weak. For those whose bodies are enfeebled by disease, by whose spirits are debilitated by illness, that they may be restored to wholeness of life. Particularly, I lift up Jennifer Renault at St. Joe Hospital for treatment for infection. May it go well with her and with others who tend to those who are ill and in need. We pray for our brothers and sisters of our church family, our neighbors, acquaintances at work and life, that all may be well with them, with their soul and with their spirit and with their body. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, your servant Paul was imprisoned for preaching the good news of Jesus for any who are wrongly incarcerated, that they might be liberated for those whose guilt is valid and imprisonment warranted, that they may know genuine repentance of their sin and reconciliation with their community. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are bereaved this week for the family of Russell Heath, my uncle, taken unto your kingdom at the wonderful age of 96, a faithful servant of your church, be with his family, his sons, his daughter-in-laws, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, that he is a saint of the light. For gracious God, you have called us as your children. We are bold to ask for what we need and confident in your goodness. Through faith in our Lord and brother Jesus Christ, amen. May we pray together in heart and mind and soul as Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
well, we go nowhere by accident. For wherever we go, God is sending us. For wherever we are, God has put us there. For God has a purpose in our being there. And know that Christ wants to do something through you, where you are right now. Go forth in the love of God, the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen.